is my conflict of interest statement. Uh, and I want to start by expressing my thanks to so many people. Uh, for starters, Dr. Uh, DePillis, who has been a good friend and uh, I've learned a lot from her. Dr. Alex Karazi was my uh, PhD who did the heavy lifting in, at the bench. And then people who financed uh, my work, uh, the uh, St. Vincent Medical Center, which unfortunately has had a demise, and various people uh, and sources of funding. And I ask your indulgence, I'm going to be discussing some personal things, uh, some commercial things, and I am not a trained mathematician. I'm, I like it, but I, uh, I'm not trained that way. Um, Isidore Ravy, the uh, Nobel Prize winner, apparently was quoted by saying, uh, when he came home from school, his mother didn't say, well, what did you learn today? He said, did you ask good questions? It's a very shrewd mother. So uh, I, uh, I think my presentation is gonna be centered on the development of asking good questions. Now, in the 70s, I was in Houston. I was doing bench work on mouse memory tumor virus. My chief kept saying, uh, do uh, some vaccine work. I wasn't uh, terribly interested at first. Uh, the, the milieu at the time, I guess this doesn't show too well, was that chemotherapy was the best hope, which was true. Go back at the time, and it was also informed by uh, a, a mathematical model, uh, the skipper Shable work initially with uh, L1210 uh, mouse leukemia. Uh, so that was nice. Here's, here's some real science in a medical program. I like that. Um, the, is it, yeah, there it is. Uh, this was a major dogma of the time. It is still widely believed. And I think it set back research enormously and is wrong. Uh, this is uh, something that we see all the time. And then the notion that viruses uh, don't cause cancer. Well, this was a paper uh, that I I copied, I heard the data presented uh, at a meeting, and here's an ugly collection of cells. And here after a vaccine program, they disappeared. So obviously uh, with this particular vaccine program, uh, here's macroscopic bulk disease and it regressed. And to me, the question is not that it regresses infrequently. I mean, uh, any number of phase one studies show absolutely no activity at all, but to have one or two people out of a clinical trial show major regression, uh, to me, the question is, well, what's happening there, not in terms of what happens in the people who failed. Uh, with Professor Juilliard's work in, in the 70s, uh, there were 19 patients he studied and five of them had greater than 50% reduction, which to me is much more important than all of the studies that showed no reductions or no changes at all. This is a uh, slide from Cooley. Uh, we see it all the time. Uh, if, you if you had... Uh, uh, clinical regression, you had a positive T cell response or antibody response or whatever it is. Uh, the correlation was prognostic, but not predictive. And as we just heard, um, immune responses can be the result of treatment, not the cause of the treatment. 
And then this was some work that I was doing uh, with mouse memory tumor virus. And uh, it, it was clear that human beings have all sorts of immune responses to this virus. Uh, and then the question becomes, well, that's nice. Does that mean that this virus is involved in the etiology of breast cancer? So the community wisdom uh, didn't seem to fit right with me. Uh, I mentioned item one already. Um, the uh, criteria for deciding that a virus or any other pathogen is the causal agent uh, of a disease is something to consider. And lastly, I remember doing some homework on trying to understand why everybody said that the immune response is not sufficient to work with advanced tumor. And the best I could come up with was that one of the founders of immunotherapy in the 70s uh, said so. Uh, Louis Pasteur was afraid to use uh, his immunotherapy against established rabies, um, but maybe he should have pursued that a little bit further too. Anyway, this is, uh, this is what bothers me, the black box. And uh, the question is, what are the right questions? So, Here's a premise that cytotoxic lymphocytes are to tumors as microorganisms are to illnesses. And it's important that we understand the immune mechanism because if we did, we might be able to have a surrogate. The surrogate might be able to identify early response or futility. Uh, it might help with patient selection. It might help with the rational design of dose route and uh, schedule about which we know very, very little. Uh, most uh, studies uh, rely on the Goldilocks effect. Let's give just the right amount, not too hot, not too cold, but just right. And all this is empirical and without a rational basis. Um, assuming that there is a cell or cells involved in mediating an immune response, uh, how do we know it? And would we recognize it if we saw it? Uh, CAR T cells, uh, one clone, 10 to the eight cells can be curative. So why isn't the body making 10 to the eight cells of, uh, of effective cytotoxicity? Uh, is the immune response maybe se sequential? Uh, or does it involve other modes of, uh, of immune responses? I'm not totally clear on that. And while we scientists like to have a uh, unitary solution to something, uh, is it possible that the immune response is uh, like the kinds of questions that uh, we were tortured with in history class, you know, what was the cause of the Civil War? How was uh, World War II ended? Uh, you know, where it becomes argumentative as to which was the uh, effective uh, final common pathway. So let's say a few things about what do we really mean by a cause? Uh, Aristotle reminded us that when we're talking about a cause, uh, we have to speak the same language. What caused the, uh, I think it was cholera epidemic, the, the Broad Street pump or the microorganism? It, it depends on what the context is. Uh, for a house, what caused the house, the lumber? Oops, excuse me. Uh, the formal cause uh, was the architect, the efficient cause, et cetera, et cetera. So that was Aristotle. Galileo thought that we knew cause if it, we identified some factor that was necessary and sufficient. Uh, Hume came along and said, we don't know a thing about cause. Uh, it's a matter of habit. We know that if you poke one billiard ball and it hits another billiard ball, that's the cause. We also know 
that there are other things that follow that are not causally related. So how do we know that day doesn't cause night to fall? There's no causal relationship there. I mean, that's, that's the sequence, but it's not causal. So Hume said, we don't know anything about cause. Uh, Koch uh, addressed the problem. Well, everybody's coming up with a cause for TB and they were isolating all sorts of different organisms. And was TB caused by M. bovis or M. tuberculosis or some other microorganism? Koch established some criteria. Uh, the Surgeon General was essentially a uh, extension of that kind of reasoning as to what constitutes a cause. Uh, and then lastly, uh, the hero, uh, I think, of our times is Judeo Pearl. And I will get to that a little bit later as we go along. So here is how uh, Koch uh, thought we could identify a cause. Uh, we had to find a microorganism that was, uh, had a high association. It must be isolated, cultured, uh, uh, distributed according to the disease. And after it was cultured, uh, it would cause another disease when uh, injected into the, uh, the mouse or whatever. This was very quickly modified because um, mycobacterium creates a funny disease that's much different in a mouse than it is in a human. Uh, the most sophisticated uh, now definitions as to what constitutes proof that a isolated pathogen is the causal uh, uh, agent in a disease is the Bradford Hill criteria. Um, I could give you the citation uh, of a review by Larson. And these are the, these, are the criteria, isolation, epidemiology, I'm sorry, the strength of the association, temporality, one has to come before the other, uh, exposure, uh, dose response is a very important uh, issue. Uh, and here another uh, uh, list of uh, criteria. The Surgeon General's report on how do we know that smoking uh, causes cancer is a similar kind of argument that it fulfills all the criteria. Um, whenever these kinds of things are, um, are cited, uh, we go back home comfortable that yes, A causes B. Uh, the, Usual uh, caveat, though, is that, well, this is a, a, um, uh, a, a uh, what do they call it in, in crime? Circumstantial evidence, you know, but it's very strong circumstantial evidence. But uh, Lawson and Glenn published a paper in 2022 employing all of these and walking away with the uh, argument that yes, indeed, mouse mammary tumor virus does indeed uh, cause breast cancer in approximately 40% of the cases. That's not widely appreciated or believed, but we'll watch that fight. Uh, I left uh, Houston in 1980. Most of my work subsequently was uh, done at St. Vincent Medical Center. Uh, I didn't do too much bench work. Uh, I mentioned my colleague, Dr. Sparazzi. Uh, I was in private practice and I did clinical trials with uh, a vaccine uh, that evolved uh, and the community wisdom had not much changed. Uh, since that time, the mathematical model, the skipper Shabel model, uh, has been um, uh, sent to the museum. There is no mention of any of that kind of mathematics in Harrison uh, at the recent edition. And so the, the fun part of doing oncology with a, uh, a mathematical basis seems to be out the window for the time. 
but I believe that vaccines could uh, cause regression of advanced disease. I thought that's not a dumb idea. We had the technology for creating single cell suspensions. We had uh, extensive resources and uh, while people were doing vaccine studies with various modifications, uh, uh, upregulating antigenicity with influenza virus or some such. I thought if we keep it simple, the FDA approval would be simpler too. And I said, it's not a dumb idea. Uh, over the years, I uh, accumulated approximately 431 cases uh, of various uh, diagnoses. Uh, you can see mostly breast, uh, mostly melanoma, but a substantial number of breast, colon, and other kinds of uh, diagnoses. Uh, I was very aggressive in doing serial bleeds on patients that were treated. Uh, and also in many cases, we were able to create short-term tissue culture cell lines from these various diagnoses. Right now they're in liquid nitrogen, just sitting there waiting uh, patiently. There have to be answers in those liquid nitrogen tanks, just uh, waiting for the right questions. So here's my response now to when people say that vaccines uh, are too weak to benefit advanced disease. I'm gonna show you evidence some more, and also the Bria cell experience that falsifies this premise. Uh, the chief, when I was in Houston in the virology department, was very fond of saying it only takes one ugly fact to falsify a beautiful theory. It only took 103 feet of independent flight by the Wright brothers to say, no, it is possible. And to me, there's such substantial evidence that uh, tumor vaccines can cause regression of advanced disease that uh, I, I don't understand the, uh, the prevalence of this. But the literature, even in a recent um, uh, uh, comment by a man who did some magnificent uh, vaccine work in, in pancreas cancer, is still based on this belief we're better off uh, doing clinical trials in subclinical disease. Those are very expensive. They take a long time. And uh, what we really want to know is what's going on. So here's my rebuttal. Uh, the uh, work, I think, of uh, Kuhn and the scientific revolutions uh, has established that laws of impotence really advanced science. When you know you can't make a, uh, um, a, a perpetual motion machine, you get a more reasonable energy directed at uh, honest thermodynamics. When you know that you cannot turn uh, lead into gold, you develop a systematic chemistry. Newton apparently spent most of his life actually trying uh, to solve the alchemy problem. And what he did in mathematics and physics was probably a, a side venture. Um, the, uh, excuse me. the literature is plenty, plentiful. And um, as I said, the hard, ugly fact falsifies the data. Um, I think I'm running out of time. But uh, here is an example of a very advanced melanoma. Uh, and you can see all these uh, black, black spots. Uh, this was biopsy proved melanoma. And on the left side, you can see big tumor. And on the right side, it's not, it's much, much smaller here are a bunch of splenic metastases and after vaccine treatment. This was uh, studied by three uh, radiologists uh, that were friends of mine. Uh, they were blinded as to what they were looking at and all three of them came very close. They said this is 900 cc's of tumor that has regressed. Next question. 
Uh, over the years, my vaccine work uh, changed. Initially, it was whole cell intralymphatic therapy. Then we started using cyclophosphamide. And you can see there were a number of other intermediary steps. The most cogent, though, is a genetically engineered uh, cell line that releases GMCSF. Uh, the name of this vaccine uh, has changed throughout studies. At that time, it was called GEV, genetically engineered vaccine. Um, in my studies, uh, it showed uh, what was a very good uh, survival. Uh, it was the cell line, as I mentioned, is transfected to release GMCSF. Uh, and um, we also did some other little modifications there too. GMCSF, for those that aren't familiar, is the darling of immunologists. Everybody thought it was going to be the answer. Uh, it has a number of uh, effects uh, on the immune response, uh, including upregulation of dendritic cell activity, uh, cell maturation, and uh, generally improving the uh, afferent loop of the immune response. Uh, this is a picture of the cell line. And this was the result uh, of the application of this vaccine. After three vaccines, you can see there was a dramatic regression of tumor. After six vaccines, there was, I think, 94% uh, regression of tumor. Uh, at this point, the FDA said, you got to stop because the protocol you wrote said only six vaccines. And I didn't argue. Sometimes you can argue with the FDA, but I didn't hear. And it turns out that the patient relapsed. When she relapsed, she had brain metastases. And after I treated her again, not only did the breast regress uh, following that treatment, but there, there were a number of metastatic sites and those uh, regressed. Uh, so this was now data that uh, vaccine therapy was going to be effective in a counterintuitive site. And this was evidence that when a patient was treated, there was a response. When you stop treatment, there was a relapse. And when you treat it again, there was a response. And that's a pretty strong argument for association. You can't dismiss that as a spontaneous regression. Can, can so, you frequently get like the same treatment this, this was the genetically modified cell line that releases GMCSF. OK. Now, uh, that program stopped in 2006 because the hospital thought research uh, was not part of uh, the mission of the hospital. It took uh, some time, but ultimately I was able to get financing and the creation of the Bria Cell Organization. Um, I think this is slides from a collaboration uh, lecture with MD Anderson. And uh, we were able to demonstrate that the use of this uh, vaccine could uh, make a cold tumor turn hot. Huh. I'm very clumsy with this thing. Uh, and like that first uh, slide that I showed you earlier, um, it was effective in brain metastases. Uh, here's a retroorbital lesion, um, and uh, the predilection for responses in brain is quite mysterious as far as I'm concerned, but in a recent evaluation of 54 patients treated in our uh, phase one, two program, which I should mention also involved uh, uh, also involved the use of a checkpoint inhibitor. Uh, there were seven patients who had metastatic disease in the brain. And of those seven, five of them had objective regressions and some complete re re remissions. 
five out of seven is unheard of in any kind of a phase one trial. Uh, response and survival, this is a delay type hypersensitivity, but there was an analysis that I was going to discuss where the overall survival was 13 months. Uh, that's been revised, it's now 15 months. And this is a brain tumor study. Uh, there's another slide, I'm sorry, it, it didn't show up. Uh, but the uh, overall survival of 15 months in patients who had five or six previous chemotherapies, again, is just unheard of. So coming back to that black box I showed, how are we to understand what was going on here? And with the state of the art now, uh, any assay is liable to produce hundreds, if not thousands of data points. If you, uh, and we did uh, send uh, some sera for analysis of antibodies, we came out that there were hundreds of antibodies that were related. So how do we identify the relevance and whether and what uh, responses uh, are involved in the cancer treatment? And to this extent, I am very impressed with the work of Judea Pearl. I'm sure there are people here who know this far better than I do, but in broad brush strokes, he attacked the uh, dogma that correlation is not causation. But he said, if you make a perturbation in one of the data sets, and that perturbation causes a perturbation in the other data set, it's hard to escape the concept that that's causality. So he's developed a, a, a very esoteric, to me, uh, methodology for making quite quantitative solutions to things like policy questions that previously we could never uh, uh, develop. Uh, we could develop a whole list of criteria like the uh, uh, Koch uh, uh, postulates, uh, but we couldn't really claim that it was um, uh, quantitative, but um, uh, this this now this approach now does permit a quantitative uh, analysis of causality, and uh, as a result, it's considered the revolution in uh, in this field. Uh, there's a journal of causal influence. I think there's something like ten thousand papers now. Uh, he invented a new kind of mathematics, uh, uh, and he also employed uh, the use of, um, uh, of nonlinear uh, diagrams. Uh, the current mathematics that has an equal sign means that you can play it backwards, but you can't play backwards a unidirectional cause and effect. Rain makes mud but mud doesn't make rain. And the mathematics of, uh, of, of his uh, methodology uh, is, able to, uh, is able to include and emphasize this. So the conclusions that uh, I wanna lead you with are that whole cell vaccines can elicit tumor regression. Uh, for some reason, particularly in the central nervous system in our experience, uh, that uh, instrumental methods can generate an enormous uh, data pool. And what do you do with this uh, a surplus of benefits? And characterization of the mechanism of action will require systems, uh, biology approaches, artificial intelligence, and the careful framing of uh, testable hypotheses. Uh, the work with the vaccine with Briacel is now underway as a phase three trial, and we're very excited about that. It's going to be in 31 different uh, uh, centers. Uh, but independent of that, there's, uh, and going forward, it's going to be possible to uh, analyze immune responses in those people. But um, while we're waiting for that to happen, as I mentioned, uh, there's still quite a few specimens, several thousand actually, 
in liquid nitrogen at this time, just waiting for some kind of uh, effort. Um, so this is sort of a list of uh, actual and potential um, uh, resources, sequential bleeds, archive Sarah. Uh, it's now uh, possible at some company to take the peripheral blood lymphocytes and isolate the uh, actual tumor. Uh, epitope characterization, antibody uh, specificity, TCR specificities. Uh, with a drop of blood, you can study a hundred different cytokines, uh, and there are uh, a number of other in vitro tests. I don't need to go into that. Uh, but to me, uh, a group project that develops a parsimonious strategy of developing uh, and characterizing the immune response uh, would be something of, uh, of great uh, interest and uh, great importance. Uh, it would require prioritizing uh, data collection, uh, minimizing the, uh, the use of precious resources, uh, and minimizing costs. But uh, going forward, I think that's uh, what I want to leave you with, these are now the, the impetus and the demand for us to frame good questions. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, thank you, Dr. Wiseman. 